Hi everybody, this is David Thompson and welcome back to Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm joined today uh, by two individuals. It's a real treat to have three of us here on one call. I'm here with Ben Wright and Zach Drescher, who are the co-editors of Apocalypse and the Millennium in the American Civil War Era, which is coming out this fall with LSU Press. So, uh, Ben, Zach, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, David. Uh, So, gentlemen, I was... Curious, you know, this edited work is based off a conference that the two of you put on at Rice. Uh, and I wondered if you could just perhaps give us a little bit of a background into the origins of the conference, how it kind of came about, and how that morphed into this edited collection. Sure. Uh, I can start with that. So, in many ways, Vernon Burton is to blame. Uh, Vernon came to Rice in the spring of 2009 uh, to discuss Age of Lincoln his book, which is a great book, by the way. And uh, during that, his presentation, I was hearing him discuss uh, millennialism. In his case, he uses it to discuss post-war Christian nationalism. And I was making connections with uh, other reading I had done, um, other ways that scholars had used millennialism. Mark Knoll kind of talks about a millennial component to the crisis of the Civil War, the theological crisis. Uh, Chandra Manning talks about the uh, abolitionist millennialism of the Union Army. Uh, it's, it's in Harry Stout's uh, Upon the Altar of the Nation as a kind of motivation for the turn to total war. So in reading all of these different interpretations of millennialism, I was frustrated in that it seems like it was coming up all over the place, but in ways that didn't quite cohere. So uh, I talked with Vernon about this, and he, uh, he congratulated me on finding my dissertation topic, but I was very resistant to that. I already had one of those um, my dissertation is on uh, religious conversion and the development of the anti-slavery movement. But I was interested in the problem, and so I, I figured I would outsource the problem in a way to other scholars by putting on a conference. And that's where I brought Zach in. Um, Zach is and has always been a far more rigorous intellectual historian. And spe- uh, particularly for kind of thorny theological issues like millennialism, I, I needed his expertise. And uh, so from the start, Zach and I we're having conversation and decided to put together a conference. Lucked into getting some pretty tremendous contributors and it went from there. Yeah. And I mean, I think we exploited the resources we had at Rice. Uh, there's a pretty good community of civil war scholars at Rice, folks we could bounce ideas off of. Um, we have the Journal of Southern History at Rice and those, the folks involved there are very good with organizing and, and helping us figure out how to, uh, not only put together a conference, but especially how to edit things, because that's what they do. They edit things, and, and we, we learned from, from them about that. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's just kind of, kind of lucky that I was already sort of studying religion in the Civil War. wasn't fully set at the time, but I, I did have this background in the history of theology and, and intellectual history, and so it just, uh, you know, it's just fortuitous that our interests meshed in that way. Right. Now, did you have plans from the get-go, or I guess hopes, that this would morph into an edited collection? We certainly had those ambitions early on, and uh, we invited Mike Parrish from Baylor, who edits the, the series with LSU, the Conflicting World series, down to be a commentator. And uh, that might have been partially a strategic decision on trying to rope him in early. Uh, but really, in conversations with him after the conference, that was what confirmed to us that we have something here that would work uh, as a volume and really would make a genuine contribution. So... We, we we had envisioned that the potential for that from early on, but uh, the really the success of the conference and the quality of the conversations, uh, both within and kind of without the actual formal presentations, are what pushed us over the edge to to really make a go for it. Now, what is it about the 19th century and the Civil War era that makes it such a transformative period uh, for some of our viewers who? may not be as intimately aware of religion during the war or, or the, the war era. What is it uh, that ties in providentialism, millennialism, specifically to, the, to this moment in time? So, I mean, at least one of the, the ways in which millennialism is, is so kind of intimate, intimately bound up with the event is, is the sense uh, of progressive history that so kind of imbued... Um, the way that people thought about the present and the future, the expectation of a consistently improving world, marching towards the kingdom of God, made every single element of dissension and conflict 
uh, a tremendous problem. Um, social conflict was more than just uh, a social problem. It was, in fact, an in, in inhibition to achieving the kingdom of God. So it's, it's this kind of expectation of um, a progressive march towards the kingdom of God that makes millennial anxieties kind of take on such a, uh, a greater importance. And, and I would add to that uh, developments coming from the world of intellectual history. Um, Louis Menand, I think, is right in tracing the beginnings of the American crisis over modernism to the, the Civil War era. Uh, there's big problems going on or that are at least um, kind of surfacing. I mean, nobody in America knew about Darwin right when it was published, um, but it was published right on the eve of the Civil War, and it was available during the Civil War. There's, there's new ideas circulating. There's logical positivism. Um, and so there's new biblical criticism. That's, that's, I mean, it's still a little early, but you can, can see the rumblings of change. Um, and then the end of our volume, we, we get into some of the, the later decades of the 19th century, and um, these changes are more evident. So... The 19th century is just a time when everything's changing. Uh, so that's an aspect of progress, right, that everything's changing. Um, but folks, folks are worried, especially religiously minded folks. And nearly everyone falls into that category during the Civil War era. Now, you have your conference, which by all accounts was a wonderful occasion. And then uh, the decision is made and there's interest out there for an edited collection. I wonder if the two of you could kind of take us a little bit behind the scenes of what this process is really like to move from the idea and perhaps from acceptance um, by a press to actually getting it to publication. Yeah, well, immediately after the conference, in fact, I think a day and a half after the conference, Zach and I crawled into a car and drove halfway across the country. So we had a lot of very kind of intimate time to try to figure out uh, what, our, what our plan was going to be. Um, and, you know, I, I will say that we had a lot of anxiety going in, hearing, knowing the way that academics can be and the prospect of trying to wrangle um, 11 academics into producing a kind of coherent volume. The old you know, parable of herding cats came to mind. Um, but we really lucked out, and we've, we've got folks that were kind of unusually accommodating. And uh, I think that partially because it grew out of a conference, that's what helped. People understood where, uh, where, where, where each other was going, and the kind of informal conversations filtered back into the content of the essays and gave it more of a, a coherence than I think sometimes you see in edited collections. We tried to develop an idea of what we wanted the volume to look like. Was the com conference uh, exactly what we wanted, or were there some ways to tweak it? And so not everybody from the conference made it into the volume uh, for various reasons, mostly because of publication agreements on their part. Anyway, but we tried to round out the volume um, to address gaps that we thought that the volume had. We tried to bring someone uh, in talking about um, Mormon millennialism in, in this era, and that just didn't work out. We heard of uh, Matt Harper's work. Matt Harper wasn't at the conference, but we brought him on board because his work fits very well with what we're doing. So there was some, some planning and some outreach into trying to rounded out by bringing in new perspectives. Another question I had for, for you two guys is, obviously when you get into the realm of co-editing something, uh, there are some immediate benefits that you can see. You can divvy up the work responsibilities. Um, but there are also inherent in, in a co-editing project some pretty significant difficulties in terms of making your two voices one for uh, certain areas and, and really trying to be on the same page. I was wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit to what it's like to work collaboratively with, with someone else on a project like this. Well, Zach is a huge jerk. So uh, <laughs> that, that, with that framing device, actually it worked, it worked kind of shockingly well. Um, in fact, I found it to be a kind of wonderful uh, side project. And when compared to kind of the crushing isolation of, of, of the normal process of historical research, locking yourself alone into a cold archival space and living with these historical characters in your head for years, the, the opportunity to kind of share this project with somebody else um, made it so kind of collaboratively, uh, collaborative and, and alive. So that was, that was really actually really wonderful. Um, 
Also, I think that Zach, Zach might disagree, but uh, I think our personalities worked particularly well. Um, we, we made a nice compliment for one another. Um, Zach managed to calm me down quite a bit, and our kind of editorial style, styles mesh. Um, I might have been inclined to be a little bit more of an active editor, uh, <laughs> and Zach, I think, managed to restrain me a little bit. I would call you an editorial dictator. Um, <laughs> it's it's a little stronger than that. I mean, that, this is an example of, of the kinds of conversations we had. He would want to interfere with phrasing more than I would want to interfere with it. Um, but I, I think overall, you know, we met in between, ended up editing the things that needed it and the things that didn't. I mean, he was his activism is, was welcome, uh, definitely. So it worked out. Now, Ben and Zach. Ben, you are a doctoral candidate at Rice. Uh, Zach, visiting assistant professor at uh, Virginia Tech. So, one, a current grad student, one, a very, very, very recent grad student. I wonder if you both uh, could perhaps offer a little bit of advice uh, for grad students uh, in history uh, who are making their way through this journey. Yeah, I think that um, grad students should take our example as... Uh, not an abnormal one, but one that can be can be followed. I think that grad students need to make a name for themselves, need to try to find ways of doing stuff other than just finishing the dissertation and, and heading out there. Um, and I think that it's important to try to see if you've got money around, laying around in the university that might be available for a project like this if you've got an idea. I mean, that differs according to where you are. But it never hurts to ask to try to do things like this. Graduate students have a valuable perspective to offer. Um, when you're in your coursework, particularly when you're preparing for your, for your exams, you're kind of straddling the field in a way that really nobody else is. Nobody else is taking time to fully wrap their head around these kind of big, broad fields. And there's something that's going to come out of that perspective that you really have to offer. Um, so I would encourage... I would encourage early career folks to to recognize that they have a valuable role to play in the discipline and to play it. Um, if you if you if you take yourself seriously and you have a quality project, other people will take it too, regardless of what your status is. And I was actually kind of pleased to see that um, we had a interesting project. We had some great questions, and so folks uh, jumped on board. Um, with, with tremendous enthusiasm because of the quality of those questions. So if you've got some good questions, pursue them as hard as you can, as fast as you can, and with a, as big of a microphone as you can, um, because you have something to offer. I wonder if, if both of you could perhaps speak to kind of what your sense of a kind of a takeaway is for readers. Uh, perhaps you may each could highlight uh, one or two essays that you like. I realize it's, it's tough to pick favorites uh, when it comes to an edited collection, um, but perhaps both of you could speak to it really in your mind, if somebody picks up this book, uh, well, I guess after they've picked it up and they put it down, what, what your hope is uh, that they've, they've taken away from this experience? I guess I'll start this one. Um, this volume really meshes well with my overall work, and my overall project is one that's... Um, familiar to scholars of religion right now in that what we're trying to do is to say that religion matters and it matters in a, a fundamental way. It's not something to take on as a, you know, a side note to uh, the, the main story of American history. Religion is right in the midst of everything. I mean, John Butler in his famous essay called Religion, uh, the approach to, that scholars of the 20th century used was of religion as kind of a, a jack-in-the-box that pops up whenever it's needed, whenever it seems a little interesting. Um, so what we're doing is trying to say that religion matters, that belief shapes actions in all sorts of realms of human activity, not just in the church. Um, and on top of that, I mean, my special talking point that I, that I like to push is that within that, theology matters. Re religious ideas matter. Um, and, and average people have a theology. It doesn't just have to be the history of cloistered minds in the seminary. Um, and now, not this whole volume is an intellectual history. I don't want to give that um, impression. But my work is, and I, I like to think that what I do and what others do in this volume is show that um, theological concerns were shared by broad swaths of people, not just seminarians and theologians. Yeah, and as far as an illustration of that, the, the kind of illustration that religion can have causative power. 
Uh, I would I would highlight Scott Nesbitt's article on forgiveness and land policy uh, in South Carolina. Uh, the way in which religious discourse over forgiveness ended up having a kind of causative influence on the way in which the discussion over land redistribution took place. So I would again double down on Zach's comment that the takeaway that you should get is religion matters. And if you want to understand the Civil War and the Civil War era, uh, religion is not a sideshow. It belongs on the battlefield. It belongs on the home front. It belongs in understanding the causes of the Civil War and in the consequences. All right. Well, Ben and, and Zach, thanks so much for taking some time out of your uh, respective days to speak with us. Again, uh, the book is Apocalypse and the Millennium in the American Civil War Era. comes out uh, in November with LSU Press. I was very fortunate to get a sneak peek of it. Uh, so many thanks to Ben and Zach for that. And it, I can honestly say it's, it's a great uh, synthesis of this topic looking at a uh, well, whole variety of angles into why religion matters and uh, count me in that camp saying that it certainly matters for this time period. So, Ben, Zach, thanks so much again for coming on with us, and uh, hope to have you both on again in the future uh, talking about those uh, cloistered, isolated uh, solo projects that you both are working on. Thanks, thanks. Dave. Okay.